it's amazing that the church saying that the Eucharist is the source and summit of Christian life, and it's true uh, that it is, it is a place that everything comes together. And all the things that we know, that we ever discover about our faith, is hidden in this one sacrament, in the Eucharist. All the things that we talk about for the last little while can also be discovered in the Eucharist, particularly in the celebration of the Holy Mass. So I want to spend some time to kind of unpack the some of the symbolisms, some of the mysteries contained within. But before I go in there, I just want to share with you an experience uh, that, that we experience in the church today. And it could be, you know, a, a weakness, a threat, but I, I think it's more an opportunity. And and then I think we, we finally come to realize that we need to do things differently. The last three years I've been involved heavily on uh, not only retreats and giving missions, but really equipping lay evangelizers. We, we have a great need today. We know that. We, we don't have more priests. We have fewer priests. But also the... the the situation of the world has changed. The situation of our parish has changed. Uh, of Christian, Christian life in general has changed, especially in our country. And it, it comes to the time we realize that we have to do church differently. Uh, we have to do church differently. And, and so we equip people. And, and for the last little while, you know, since John Paul II especially, uh, many, many people are willing to, to go out to speak uh, about uh, the truth, about the faith, uh, to share uh, what they experience in the Lord. But that always begs the question, okay, you evangelize somebody, where do you send them? Right? Evangelization is not a one-off thing. It's not even a one-to-one -one thing. It's always a communal thing. Last year, when I went to Rome for the Jubilee of the, uh, the Golden Jubilee of the Charismatic Renewal, uh, and one of, the, one of the bishops, I believe it's a bishop from Poland, uh, that celebrated Mass on the second day of the conference in the morning, he says something that I think kind of link it all together. He said that you, you guys are on fire to evangelize. You know, you receive the Holy Spirit, you go to evangelize. But you have to stay with the people you evangelize. Right? In some way, you become a parent to them. You become Paul to your Timothy. You don't, you don't just give them the word and then send them somewhere. You kind of adopt them. <laughs> but even that is not enough. Like, it's like, well, we need a place to send them to. Like, evangelize somebody, and, and where do you send them? You send them to a church, but they don't have connection in the church. You go there. They got the fire. They go there. They got cold water. Right? We, don't, we don't have a place uh, set up for them to feel loved, to feel welcome, to feel... Uh, that they could be part of, they can develop meaningful relationship. They don't see Jesus in, in the flesh, in the people. It's not going to do any good. So evangelization is always coming back to, do we have a community that is evangelized? And then that is building on, do I have, do I have the aptitude? Do I have the courage? Do I have the urgency to build meaningful relationship? right here in my parish. So you see, it's all connected. It's all connected. I need to grow and, and, and be able to go out. I need to partner with people, and that is a testimony to others that Christ is alive, is alive here. Okay? Christ is alive here. There's a fellowship here that is not social only. There's a fellowship here that we want to be more Christ-centered. And it's not some sort of external uh, convenience or uh, the right people. No, it takes, it takes each person, me, myself, I, I want to be a builder here. Okay? I want to be a builder here. I want to be a connector here. I want to be, uh, be docile here. 
not with perfect people. Again, right? With seasick people, with not okay people. <laughs> we have to come to that realization. We are not okay, and that's okay. Right? We are together. So the not okay people coming in and say, oh, at least you are real. <laughs> I remember so many times, you know, uh, when, when I start just being natural, you know, cracking jokes and being silly and poking fun of myself. Especially when I go to a new place, the parishioner finally can breathe. He said, oh, so good, Father, you're real. <laughs> you're not un, unapproachable, you know. You're, you're like us. So, yeah, like, it took me a while to realize that, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I forgot. I forgot when, before I went to the seminary, that's how I look at the priests. Father, you're so far off, I can't talk to you. Right? Do, do we have that? May we have that in a way that's wrong, that we didn't realize? Right? That I got it all together, you are coming in, you don't know anything. That's, that kind of attitude doesn't work anymore. It never worked. The Eucharist. We, we come here for Mass, and the first thing we do, we know, we, we bless ourselves with the holy water. We, we have that habit uh, in many of the Christian homes. We have that at home as well. We come in, we go out, we bless ourselves with holy water. Why? Because we, we need to remind ourselves who we are coming in and whose house I'm coming into. I'm coming into my family home. The Lord is here. He is my King. He is my Lord. He is the owner of this place. I, I am part of his member coming in. The Vatican II documents, uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium, talks about the first revelation of the presence of Christ is in our gathering together. We come to realize that we need fellowship before Mass outside. You know, we come in, we want to welcome hospitality. You guys been to Alpha, you know what I'm talking about. We do divine renovation, you know what I'm talking about. Right? You go to a restaurant, what is the first thing they speak to you? How they welcome you. Right? Nobody's there. You wait for 30 minutes, there's no one there. You're not going to stay around. <laughs> this is a, I don't care how good the food is. <laughs> if you don't care that you are here, I'm not coming back. Right? Hospitality. Right? We need that. We need to build that home. It takes work. It takes work to know people. It takes work to see the other person as a person as part of us. We belong to each other. The sense of belonging is bestowed, not earned. Right? We, need, we know this lingo, those of you who have been to Divine Renovation, we, you, we know that. Right? We, we have we inherited the wrong kind of message often. Right? You behave, you believe, then you belong. Right? We, we may not say that, but that's what we treat, how we treat one another in the church. And that's bad, right? Sometimes, well, I come in a culture that if, you don't, if, if you're not getting good marks, it's the parents will say that, well, I will love you if you get good marks. Well, what does it mean? That I, I don't get good marks, I don't get, I, I'm, I'm not loved, I don't belong here? Right? That, that's damage, right? We do, that, we, did, we, did, we do that not intentionally, but we do that to each other. When we come to the church, we are the presence of Christ. We are different parts of the body. Some are better. Some are more hidden. Some are more useful. Some are not as useful. That says nothing about the value and the dignity of the person. It says nothing about that. We all journey at different pace, at different, ta- different parts of the journey toward the Lord, but we journey together. We need one another. We need encouragement from one another and to one another. We need to see the dignity in the other person, the presence okay, of Christ in each other. And so there's, you know, we come in, we have the entrance hymn, and some would propose to say that's the gathering hymn. Okay? It's the same thing, but it speaks to different reality. Right? We are gathering together as the body of Christ. <clears throat> Uh, symbolically and realistically. Right? We are really substantially the body of Christ together with his head in the priest. Right? So we need our shepherd. The shepherd with the flock cannot be separated. So we have full presence of God as we begin Mass. We begin the Eucharistic celebration with Christ. 
We come in to enter into remembering, renewing, because we tend to forget. One of our greatest enemies in our, in our Christian walk is that we forget. Every night when we go to bed, something happened. There's a reset button that's thrown. Right? So you wake up first thing in the morning, you forgot about God. You say, oh, I need to get... You know? <laughs> so many people are like that, right? They, they get up, they're just busy, you know? Even we I don't, I don't understand this. Retired people are busier than those who are not retired. I don't get it, right? So busy, you know? I talk to some retired people, it's, oh, yeah, I'm so busy, you know? I got volunteer here, I got work there, I, need, I got grandchildren there, you know? It's busier than before I was... I, I was retired. <laughs> There's something wrong. <laughs> but we, we, we make ourselves busy for all kinds of things. Right? And, and then we forgot. We forgot that we are the Lord's. Right? Same thing, we come to Mass. One of the first things, the first posture we have is that we have to acknowledge He is the Creator. We are His creatures. He is infinitely greater than us. And that's why we come in with the penitential right. You can say many things about the penitential rite, but what it is not, is not self-pitying. It is also not absolution. Right? It's just acknowledging that, yeah, I am a sinner, but you are infinitely good. It's an act of praise by seeing the reality as it is. It's an act of praise. Together, we are all in the same boat. We are all sinners, but you are great. You reveal your greatness in us. Isn't it crazy? We are crazy people. We are broken. We are together. God, you are great. <laughs> the more broken you are, the more real you realize how in need you are, and yet you hold each other together before the Lord. That, uh, that's a miracle. Well, we praise the Lord. Now, in Lent, we don't do this, but other part of the year, we will sing the Gloria. Well, that's to sing His praises. He's infinitely good. He's awesome. He's beyond our imagination. Right? And we need to hear Him. We need to make Him our first priority. Right? That's the first part of the Mass, what, we, what we're doing. We're acknowledging that, okay, I'm a sinner. I'm powerless. I'm broken. But He's merciful. He's my Father. He loves me. Glory to you. Right? Lead on. Change me. Right? Change me. So the third presence, you know, the first is the body and then the head in the priest. And then the third presence is, the, is the, in the proclamation of the word. The church teaches us that when someone proclaims the gospel or proclaim well, any parts of the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, the person is proclaiming in the place of Christ. As God is proclaiming. See, the Bible is written not to be read only, but more primarily is to be proclaimed. And proclaim with conviction right, that you really believe in the Word. Right? It's not easy to be a good lector. Because, because it's powerful when you know someone is speaking from his or her heart. That's just a conviction there. I still remember very keenly one of my best lessons in homiletics. It's not in the classroom. Uh, we have a friend of, of our community who is a deacon, and we went to visit him. And he was giving the homily, and he was looking to the seminarians, looking to us. He said, well, you guys, in a few years, you'll be up here preaching. You think you are going to convince anybody? He said, that's not your job. But you'll be sure that the people you're speaking to know that you are convinced. Right? Am I convinced by the Word? Right? And that speaks to all of us, not just to those who come up here to proclaim the Word. Right? We are all people of the Word. As Catholics, we need to fall in love with the Word. Because it's the Word that has the power to transform us, to speak life into us. When someone proclaims the gospel message clearly with conviction, it opens doors 
right? It allowed the people who listened to it to be softened. Now, ultimately, we, the listener, has to choose to open the door. But if we know the proclaimer is convinced, spoke with conviction, with personal conviction, as if it is coming from experience, from the heart, that makes us more ready, more willing to be softened. It's the Word of God that cuts to our heart. Right? The letter to the Hebrews said, you know, God's Word is sharper than a two-edged sword. It goes right to the junction of the spirit and soul. It goes right inside. It cuts to the heart. Right? Just like Peter's word to the first congregation of, of his first homily, it cut to the heart. Brother, what should we do? Repent and be baptized. Right? It has that power. I still remember the first time I listened to someone who spoke, who, who proclaimed the word in that way. I was already in my 20s. I never heard anyone read with such conviction. Right? It's powerful. It's powerful. Right? It, it speaks to the depth of my being that this word is true. This word is true. And we need that. The body of Christ needs that. We gather to take in that word. Now, sometimes we don't have good proclaimer, not because our proclaimers are bad people. Right? We all journey at different pace. Okay? Or sometimes it just we're not in the space to be able to listen. All kinds of reasons. Right? Sometimes it's our priest right? who may gobble up the words with the gospel. It happens. Sometimes they just don't know. Right? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Right? So what do we do? Well, we need to come prepare. Right? <laughs> Maybe we need to have a habit of reading the Word before we come to Mass right? so that we are not unfamiliar with the Word. Right? And maybe we can look beyond the mere service of the proclamation. So, so we all have to do our part, right? The part of the proclaimer is to proclaim it the best he or she can with conviction, the best he or she can. And the listener need to prepare so that our hearts may be as open, as widely open as possible. We can't just kind of say that, wow, it's boring. That's the num number one accusation about mass, right? It's boring. Yeah. It's, we call something boring because we're not part of it. But we are part of it. We're the body of Christ here. The body of Christ, Christ, therefore, is the proclaimer, proclaiming Christ, which is the word, to Christ, the body. Right? So at the literature of the word, what happens is that Christ is giving, giving Christ to Christ. It's kind of confusing. <laughs> now that you're thoroughly confused, right? Because we, the body of Christ, need to be renewed. If you think about it, we are like the blood in the body, right? It's circling around in the body. The blood needs to be renewed when it comes back to the heart. Right? So the Word is the first time it got recharged. Right? It come to be transformed by the Word. So this, we, the blood in the body of Christ, or whatever the imagery you want to use, we can be renewed to be the purer blood, can be filled with nutrients to bring to the different parts of the body. Right? We can be more fully Christian by allowing Christ to be formed in us through the Word. And then, of course, part of that is the homily given by the priest, trying to apply the Word into our life situation. Well, to that I would say that a lot of Catholics would complain that, oh, you know, our priests are not good preachers. To that, I would say that, well, some are, some are not. <laughs> and, but then you have to look at it this way. Not every priest has the gift of preaching. Does it make him not a good priest? Right? He may be good in other things. He may be a very compassionate, maybe someone who can work really well with the poor. Right? We all have different gifts. Do we pray for our priest? 
Matthew Kelly would say, you know, he would come to Mass, he would bring his journal. One of the prayers he would say is that, Lord, give me something, a word at this Mass that I can use for the coming week. It could be coming from the choir, it could be coming from one of the prayers, it could be coming from the priest, it, could, it need not be coming from the harmony, it could be coming from the harmony. Something, something in this Mass I can use. And he said that, he, he said that every week he gets something. So, so, again, you know, it's our disposition that I want to be renewed by the Word because the body needs to be renewed. And then, of course, the fourth, the full presence of Christ happens at the Eucharistic liturgy. And here, the symbolism is profound. It's really deep. At the beginning of the Eucharistic liturgy, we, br we bring in the gifts. Now, we bring in the wine, we bring in the bread. Yes, we bring in your money as well, right? But those are not the gifts, right? Those are not the gifts. What is the real gift? You. You are the gift. And you are represented especially in the bread and the wine. In the document in the first century uh, called the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, Didache, he says that the bread, he emphasized the bread are taken from grains gathered from the field. You are the grains. You are the grains coming from different, uh, different, different uh, plants, right? different weeds. Right? You are gathered and yet you are broken, crushed, brought together, knit together, and die together to be raised together into something completely different in the bread. Our life together, our sacrifice in building one another together is our offering. Our fellowship is our offering. Our joys together is our offering. Our willingness to look deeper in each other is our offering. That's on the table. And then the wine. Wine are gathered from the graves in the vineyard. We are the graves. And how do we make wine? Well, you first have to make grape juice, right? You crush them by dirty feet. <laughs> or maybe not so dirty feet, right? <laughs> you squeeze the life out of you. It's pretty violent. You think about that. You got, you know, squeezed out of you. And you have to mix in with those guys I don't like. Right? You got squeezed out together. It's distinguishable, and that's distinct from its origin. And then you have to die in fermentation so that something better may come out. Wine. That's the best we can, Right? Bringing grain into bread, bringing grapes into, into wine on the altar. And what are we going to do with that? Jesus, the head, is taking the body and say that this is my body, this is my blood. Yes, we are the offering with Jesus being transformed into fully Jesus. That's the heart of discipleship, that we gather people. Yes, you're broken. Yes, that's fine. You know, we're fellow grapes. We're fellow grains. We are crushed. Yes, come together. We die together. We rise together. Not letting you go. Right? You may not like it, but I would not stop calling you brother or sister. There's a letter that, uh, there's a homily that St. Augustine wrote about the Donatists. The Donatists are the people that refuse to acknowledge those who apostatize. Yeah? Because at the time there's persecution. So when the Roman soldiers came, you deny your faith. When they leave, they go to, you go to confession. And they said, the Donatists said, no, 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 no. You betrayed your faith, you cannot come back. St. Augustine said, no. You can, they can come back. A lot of priests, 
right, succumb to the pressure. They, they would, you know, turn away from the faith. But then when the persecution is gone, they repent. And the Donatists couldn't accept. It's a scandal. And so they stopped calling the Catholics, well, the, the one who believe in mercy, they stopped calling them brothers. And St. Augustine said, no, you stop calling us brothers, we will continue to call you brothers because we share the same valid baptism. You don't like it? That's fine. That's your choice. But we can't stop acknowledging who you are. That's on the altar. And Jesus is making good or bad grain, good or bad grapes. He said, no, come together. And so long as you're willing to receive, I'm making you myself. And he took it, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it away. That's what he did with his body, eh? He did it by example. He took up his body and gave it to Father. Father, so will, your cup, I will drink it. Allow his body to be broken, to be shared. We come back to this, okay? So he said that you now are with me in this enterprise. That's the Eucharistic action. So this is my body, this is my child. It's not just something Jesus is doing. Yes, that's, he alone can do that. But he is doing it with us. All of us. The whole church. So that he can sanctify us, he can transform us, he can make us substantially, completely Christ. And it's not just us participating at this Mass, because the Eucharistic prayer goes on to ask the Holy Spirit to make all of us one, as the body of Christ is only one. And not only all of us here, but the whole church on earth, that's why we mentioned the Pope, our Bishop, everyone scattered throughout the world who believes. We also join with those in purgatory, we pray for the dead, and then we join with the saints and angels in heaven. So the whole church, right? the church triumphal, the church militant, and the church sorrowful in purgatory, the whole reality of the church, all combined in those grains, in those graves on the altar that have been sacra sacramentally revealed and veiled as Christ himself, because he says so. That's his desire, that all may be one, as you, Father, and I are one, that they may all be one. That's the greatest prayer in chapter 17 of John. That's the last prayer of Jesus before he gave up his life to be betrayed. That they may all be one, And that's the prayer I believe Jesus is praying in front of the Father for every one of us, for every one of our parishes, for every one of our communities. And it's up to us to believe and to hold, and to hold dear to that. And then he offered it up to the Father through him, and with him and in him, to you, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. The Greek doxology, and we say, Amen. Right? That's saying that, yeah, we're part of this too. Right? <laughs> Offer us up. Make us real. Right? That's the Mass. That's the reason why we come to Mass. Because Jesus needs us, wants us to be part of this offering, this, this family. That's the only perfect sacrifice we can possibly make during this life. Nothing else is perfect. Because it is in the Eucharistic action that Christ makes us perfect. Not because we are perfect, but He calls us into that perfection, in that 
transformation in the Eucharist as the grains and grapes that is changed in the body and blood of Christ. And then it's the time for us to come to receive communion. That's the icing on the cake. Right? I, 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 you know, I, I met many Catholics who realize that, oh, you know, I, I'm in a state of life that I cannot receive communion or uh, I have committed some grave sins so I cannot receive communion. I'm not going to Mass. A reason for going to Mass is not to receive communion. Many people cannot receive communion. Okay? Those who haven't received First Communion cannot receive communion. They still need to go to Mass. <laughs> because we are part of that offering. We, we need that transformation. We need that symbolism to seek, seek, speak to us that that's where we belong. And Jesus is calling us, I want you to be here because you are part of my body. And even when we cannot receive Eucharist for whatever reason, we can still receive spiritual Eucharist, spiritual communion. Right? Even people in grave sin, even people who are not Christian can receive spiritual communion if they want to because God works not only within, within the sacraments, He works beyond the structure, the institution of the church. Okay? So all are called. Sometimes people ask, well, I got a friend who's not Christian. Can he come to Mass? Of course. If you explain to him what's going on, you know, don't leave him in the cold. Like I, I once chastised a friend of mine. He said, well, yeah, a friend of mine want to go to church, so I gave him the address. What do you mean? You didn't go with him? <laughs> While I'm busy, I'm going to another church. I don't know which Mass I will go to. Well, you didn't go to with your friend. He never been to church. He will be completely confused. <laughs> I got people who actually told me, I said, well, yeah, the first time I go to Mass, I don't know what's going on. They, they're all mumbling the same words. They're standing, kneeling, and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. They all go up to receive this piece of bread. I, I thought I need to go up. <laughs> I didn't know what to do, you know. So, so confused. <laughs> no, you're going to send someone to Mass, go with him, Right? Be sure to explain things to him at least after, if not during the Mass. Right? We, we need accompaniment. Accompaniment is love. Accompaniment give them courage, encourage them, make it a life, make it real to them. Right? So we receive communion. If each time we come up to the priest, we say, the body of Christ. And what do you say? Amen. Yeah. It's amazing today, I don't know what's happening here in Halifax, but in Toronto, more and more people don't say anything. Oh, oh, yeah, I know. What's going on? I blame that. Well, I shouldn't blame that, but maybe our catechism is really bad. But I think the family life is really lacking today. We cannot assume anything anymore. Right? People who come to church all the time. I, I met young people who don't know the, the basic stuff. So they don't say, I mean, it's hard for the blind priest. Because your amen actually tells, you, tells, tells me where your mouth is. <laughs> and knowing where your mouth is, I know if you're receiving on your tongue, I know where to stick the host. <laughs> and it tells me if there's a person there, and I can guess where your hands would be. Right? That means it's probably below your mouth somewhere. <laughs> it's hard, you know. But here's a question. Now, this is not from the church's teaching. It's something for us to ponder. When the ministers say the body of Christ, whom is he seeing it to? If you think about it, there are three persons there. The minister, you coming up, and Jesus. And, and I think it's more powerful to think that he is saying to the Lord, the body of Christ, I acknowledge. And then you also say, Amen, I too acknowledge. I mean that we, we are in the, in the presence of God, the Creator. We don't talk to someone else in front of Him. Right? <laughs> we will be addressing all our conversation to Him. The body of Christ, yes, truly, Amen. It's a profound moment. And and in some ways, a renewal, a complete surrender to our baptismal conviction. Yes, I am. My life, I'm willing to conform to Him. And it's for that reason that the church teaches that those who, are, who have willfully chose 
to sever their relationship with the Lord cannot receive communion. Not because the Lord doesn't want to be with us, because that would be a lie for us to say amen and receive him. Without going through reconciliation, ask the Lord, teach us how to. This is not an exclusion from the love of Christ. This is a recognition of the disparity that I have chosen to alienate myself from him. And so I need to repair that by choosing to allow the Lord to reconcile me first. So a lot, a lot of people don't understand that. Right? And they think that, oh, the church is being harsh. No. No. We are recognizing the dignity of that moment as what it is. It's that really my life is open to a deeper conformity. And if there's something that stopped me there, as Scripture says, I need to leave my gift and go to be reconciled before I can come back to receive. I need to be reconciled first with the church, with the Lord. Then I can come back. Then I can come back. Because there will be no closed doors. All the doors are willing to, to be opened will come to every part of my life. Yes, every single fiber in my life, every single dark corners in my life, I surrender to you. That's what we are saying when we receive communion. Come to all parts of me. Ring over every part, my intellect, my will, my desire, my imagination, my emotions, my plans, everything, my family, my church life, my relationships, my career, my hobbies, my entertainment, my recreation, my dreams, everything. Lord, ring over them. And of course, when we receive the Lord, we, there's a time for us to therefore to deepen that it's a precious, precious moment. During Jesus' lifetime, how many people were dying to try to reach him? Right? Scripture describes that those who cannot reach him would at least yearn that his shadow may fall on some of them, and they were cured. How often, how often I, I don't know about you, I sometimes when I read the gospel, I say, I wish I was there 2,000 years ago. I said, and then I think, wait a second, I'm receiving him every day. <laughs> I'm not lacking. In fact, I'm more privileged than those in Jesus' time because they were not touching and receiving the glorified body of Christ. They were only seeing and touching the veiled glory of Christ. They haven't tasted the resurrection. I taste his resurrection every day how much more privileged we are. Okay? And so that's the time for us to really connect with the Lord. The, the church realized that, and that's why we have adoration. We want to extend that time. That's why we have the Lord in the tabernacle. We can spend extended time to enlarge that space. And it's the time of healing. Right? Things we cannot do, things we cannot solve. That's the intimate space, Jesus. You can do all things. You can change our values. You can change our thoughts. You can change our dispositions even, if you so will, let alone our illness, let alone our chronic problems. Okay? Because He can do all things. We can trust when we deepen that relationship. We need that prayer. We need that time. We need that intimacy because without it, our soul dies. Our soul dies. And then what happened after that? My answer said, go home. That's when we were most excited. Thanks be to God. Let's go to have lunch. As Chinese would say, you know, thanks be to God, we go to dim sum. 
right? If an external observer comes into a Catholic church, in t- typical Catholic church, knowing nothing about our faith, what do, you, what do you think he would think that we believe? He probably believed that, well, you guys are strange. You talk about all these wonderful things, which is very amazing, but you don't seem very excited. But as soon as the Mass is over, you guys are so excited. <laughs> so what do you celebrate? You celebrate the end of torture? Or you are really celebrating whatever you plan to do after Mass? There's something very, very wrong when we think Mass is too long, when we're not participating, we're not jumping up and down about the Lord who died for you and continued to share His body and blood with you. I think we may be taking the Lord for granted. Something for us to continue to reflect. Am I excited to go to Mass? Am I excited to enter into that transformation that I am part of? Right? And then, of course, what does the church say, really, at the end of the Mass? Was it Mass is over? I actually don't like that sent forth. Now, we, we, we probably all know where the word Mass comes from. It's come from the Latin dismissal. Ite, misa est. There are actually two sentences. Ite means all of you go. It's time to go. Not to do whatever you want, but misa est. Now, misa est is a very difficult uh, the sentence is extremely difficult to translate because I have re- I've never read any textbook that satisfies my curiosity. It just said, well, it just meant that you are sent. No, that's not what it says. You know Latin has gender, right? Misa means to be sent. But it's a feminine thing that is sent. So something feminine has been sent. What is that feminine thing? Now, traditionally, where it came from is because uh, in the early church, when there's persecution and all that, the deacons would have taken the Eucharist and take it to the homebound before communion is over. So, logically, Misa asked means that the Eucharist has been sent to the homebound, so you go too. Now, over time, the church understand that, wait a second, who is the Eucharist? You are the Eucharist. So, in some way, when we say Mass is over, they're saying the sending is over, the commission is over. No, it just started. (laughs) You go, you are commissioned. That's what it says. You are the Eucharist, or you are the church, right? Either Ecclesia or Eucharistia, Misa Est, and somehow the subject is missing. (laughs) Regardless, you, the church, the Eucharist, you are sent. You've got things to do. You're just joining. Now, here's another conundrum for you to ponder. If I say you are sent, now, to which do we call home? The place we are sent from or the place we are sent to? Where's your home? Here. At the Eucharistic table is your home. Right? So, in the theology of the Eucharist, it's It's a contradiction when we would say that I go to Mass to satisfy my obligation. No, you come home at the Eucharistic table. Whenever you're not at the Eucharistic table, you are not home. You are doing your commission. You are doing work for the Lord. There's no rest until you come back. This is home. This is the heart of the church where we are replenished, we are rejuvenated, we are transformed, we are made pure again so that we can go and be nourishing to others because now you are the Eucharist. You see the discipleship and the apostleship in this? We go out as apostles, yes, as, as, as lambs among the wolves, but we bring with us Christ in the Eucharist. We are the Eucharist. And guess what the fate of the Eucharist is? Being taken, blessed, consecrated. We don't work for ourselves. We're consecrated God's purpose. We will be broken so to feed others. Because that's what happened to Jesus in the Eucharistic action. He said, now you do the same. But don't be afraid. I am with you doing this together with you. 
so that they may have life. So that they may have life, so that they may encounter me, so that then when they see that you, the Eucharist, that you are loving one another in your partnership of evangelization, in your partnership, in the fellowship, in the community, in the, in the parish, in your family, when they see that you are forgiving, when you are praying, making sacrifices for one another, Jesus says, when they see how you love one another, they will know that you are my disciples. That's our mission. And then you bring them back. You bring your mission back. back. You bring your success back. You bring your failures back. Once again, you bring them all back home. Mass does not end. Mass does not end. The commission does not end. It, was, it will be continually recirculated, renewed. That's our Eucharist. We are the Eucharistic people. We are disciples in the heart of Jesus being made Christ. And we are apostles. We are Eucharistic apostles being Christ to others, being Jesus' love and mercy to others because the world is, it belongs to God, but who will go and be Christ to them? There's an urgency, urgency for that Eucharist to be encountered today. Again, not because we, 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 we find it difficult, not because people no longer need it, it's not because people don't, no longer recognize that need. It's because they don't see it's possible anymore. And we need to make that possible for them. We need to make it possible for them. We need to make it alive for them. We all know that. Those of you who, who, who have been inspired by someone else's ministry, those of you who have participated in ministry, we all know that moment. If you have ever encountered the living Lord, Lord, you can go back and say, that's the moment when I experienced Jesus. That's the moment when I see that person got it. We all know that. And we all can point to that it was the Lord's mercy, His love, come, when, when it comes alive. And it cannot come alive if I do not step in to be the broken Eucharist, to be the shared Eucharist, to be the feeding Eucharist. I am the Eucharist. You are the Eucharist. So as Catholics, it was extremely privileged, we are, to have this perpetuation of the Eucharistic presence among us. But we, we, we must never think that it's just for us or just for me, for my own edification. In a very real way, we must provide the meal that the Lord has provided for us. We must provide that meal to others. The Lord didn't come just for me. That song is, you know, that, uh, reflecting on Isaiah's calling, eh? Whom shall I send? Right? Whom shall I send? Right? Who, who will be my Eucharist? Who will be my body, my presence, my real presence? Right? So, we come to that, this part of the retreat, you know, every time I give a retreat or, or workshop, you know, um, it's, we don't want to kind of just take in information because we want transformation. Okay? We, we want to be able to enter into that, that response they're entering into. Okay? So I'm going to explain a bit about what we are going to be doing uh, later on because in about uh, 10, minutes or 10 minutes or so, we're going to transition into a time of adoration. And what we, what we plan to do in this time of adoration is that maybe since last night in, in different talks, you know, maybe there are a few things that, that the Lord has prompted in you. 
to go deeper, to take a different perspective, to surrender maybe some of the habits you have in your life that's not the healthiest. Or maybe some of the obstacles in your life that you find absolutely powerless. Maybe situations or people or relationships that you have tried so hard to fix and just couldn't go anywhere. Or maybe things that you just so ashamed in your life that you allow it not to be dealt with. So we need that time to allow the Lord to minister to us. And there's no better place, I think, than before the Eucharistic Lord. Because, you know, frankly, I, I'm powerless for your problem. <laughs> I don't know how to do with your problem. I just go to the Lord. So you as well, you go to the Lord. Okay. Uh, so it's really a time for you to, to respond and to ask for some special grace from the Lord. So in about uh, 10 minutes or so, we're going to prepare for adoration. It will be, we'll begin with uh, bringing the Lord out. Uh, music ministry is going to lead us in just calling the Lord, you know, that not just singing the songs, but really calling the Lord into that part of your life that has not yet been transformed that has not yet have the Lord as, the ki as, as king over, as, as the king to rule over, to reign over those areas. You know, they invite the Lord to come into that, that space. Or maybe that you need a deeper, a broader, a wider uh, enlargement, a magnification of God's presence in those spaces. Okay? So, so hopefully that, that, that uh, the time of praising the Lord will, bring, will, will open your heart. Now, open your heart wide. Say, Lord Jesus, come in. Whatever that you have, especially that, that you want to heal, that you want to strengthen, that you want to encourage, that you want to lift up, that you want to uh, comfort, that you want to bring peace to, you know, I give you permission. And then after that, I'll be leading uh, with you a few prayers to seek healing, to seek release. And toward the end, I will be bringing Jesus down to visit you, okay? to allow Jesus to pass by, okay? because Jesus wants to come close to you. He wants to heal you, wants to strengthen you. And then we have solemn benediction. Okay? So the time for Jesus to come close to you, that's the time for you to to surrender, okay? to, to give yourself over, to, to tell him, to invite him, whatever that, that stir your heart, okay? And then after the solemn benediction, uh, we'll, we'll conclude the retreat. Uh, now, during that time, I don't know how it's going to happen, but uh, we all have different needs. Uh, during the time of adoration, we also have confession available. Father Brian and Father Ken will be available for hearing confession. And then after the solemn benediction at the end, when we conclude the retreat, confession will continue until, I believe, 4.15. Yeah, so around the time before the 4.30 Mass. Okay. So that, that's uh, lined up. Um, so as I conclude this, um, just, you know, this is also the time for us to consider, uh, you know, in what ways also, you know, also the time for us to bring to that adoration is that, Lord, in what way you want me to change? Okay. To ask for that gift. You know? uh, we need one another. We need, we, we need to journey together. Okay. And I really feel strong that as a parish uh, for you, that we, we need to build up that atmosphere that, that people know that when they come in, that this is a transformed people. This is a transformed people. This is, the pe this is the people that have experienced the Lord. This is the people that rejoice readily in the Lord. This is the people that can see the Lord's face in each other. So I also encourage you to pray into that so that we are not just ending the retreat, but starting something new. Amen?